Well, welcome to a special week of programming on the 700 Club Canada. You know, the winter months bring mood changes for many across Canada with varying levels of severity. We know it's daunting for many to be facing down winter, right? Especially during a pandemic that's brought an increase in anxiety and stress and depression across the country. You know, there are several studies that have shown that the pandemic has negatively affected the mental health of a wide range of people from anxiety related to the threat of the virus to economic stress. And the recent study from CAMH showed that women and those with children were experiencing a significantly higher increase in anxiety as a result of the pandemic, with a quarter of all women reporting moderate to severe anxiety and almost 30% of parents with children under 18 reporting that they had been feeling depressed. Well, today we are going to focus our discussion on the topic of depression. Joining me once again are psychologist Dr. Mary Lynn, psychotherapist and mental health specialist Harrison Mungle, and healing communication consultant and coach Andrew Blackwood. Welcome again to the show. Thank you. Thank you. So how would you define depression? <laughs> There's a loaded question, right? Andrew, do you want to start off today? Certainly. Uh, if I think back about my life, there were many periods, uh, even during my teens, when I didn't even realize that I was experiencing depression. But as I'm older now and I can articulate it from the inside out, I can, I can recall feeling discouragement kind of seep into the cracks of my person and, and, and feeling a sense of darkness and hopelessness all around me. And um, sometimes we, if you're not experiencing depression, you think it's just feeling sad, but it's a whole lot more of that. It's a depletion of your emotions, uh, of your energy, of your strength, and of your hope. And it can last for varying periods of time and varying uh, degrees of intensity. And sometimes it looks different for different people. So especially in children that I've worked with over the years and teens, sometimes you would see aggression and anger. And those are actually outpouring of, of actual, actual depression. So it can look very different, but those are some of the emotions and the moods that come along with it. That's really helpful. Harrison, uh, can you add to that? Sure. <clears throat> you know, when I look at depression, I look at it more where stress, like psychosocial stress affects our well-being and people have a hard time learning how to cope or maybe they don't know how to cope. And so when you have these, uh, later on we'll talk about some of the chemical levels uh, when it's dropping and the mood level starts dropping, sometimes it drops so low that people start thinking negative thoughts. You know, interestingly, Laurie, like I was reading an article from Statistics Canada and we, uh, we are number four on the list for antidepressants wow. users in the world. A few years ago, we were number one and I was like so shocked for prescriptions uh, how much Canadians are struggling with depression. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we are going through depression and we have no clue it actually depression as it affects our whole neurovegetative state, you know, people sleeping, eating habits changing, uh, restlessness, can of concentrate, memory issues. Those are all symptoms that, yeah, you know, something is not right. We need to um, stop for a moment and check what we need to do rather than ignore it and it gets worse. Well, you brought up that there's a difference between seasonal depression and clinical depression. So Mary, can you help us understand what's the difference? Yeah, um, well, actually, the term clinical is um, informally used as a way to determine how dysfunctional the depression is. So seasonal affective disorder is actually a form of depression. So they can, the, the clinical piece of it, either of them, whether it's a major depressive disorder or it's uh, seasonal affective disorder, can also be quite severe. The difference between the two is that with the seasonal affective disorder, it's focused on how a person is responding to changes in the weather. Okay. So typically during the winter months or even fall when the light is less, we have less access to sun, um, people aren't able to move around as much. Uh, so people would get diagnosed with this um, and they may suffer at 40% of the year as opposed to the entire year. Whereas a major depressive disorder uh, doesn't have rhythms around the weather, it's more 
typically around stress or what might be happening with the person's life. Okay. That's where you're going to see some of the ups and downs. Good. Andrew, what are your thoughts? I'm just recalling uh, people that I've worked with over the years and some of the challenges that they face with those external stressors that kind of manifest themselves with that depletion that I talked about. Um, and some of the things that were really, really helpful were staying connected to other people, being open to allowing people to come into that space and encourage them and come alongside them. Um, one parent actually got their son a physical, uh, a, a trainer, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. To encourage them to get out, to get up. And it was, it was hard. Mm -hmm. A lot of the, from the outside, a lot of the impression uh, that people, impressions that people have about depression is that it's, it's, it's easy. Just shake it off. Right. You can do it. Um, whereas from the inside, not so easy. Yeah. So the successes that I've seen people grow through and, and come through have been as a result of, 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 of being open to that support, right. trying to have some routine and not expecting themselves to be perfect all the time, right. but continuing to put one step after the other, after the other, after the other. Well, thank you for bringing that up because I think it's true that sometimes we just say, well, just shake it off, you know, get over it. And we, mm -hmm. we overlook what may, it deeply is happening inside. So let me ask this question, the chemical aspects of depression. Harrison, would you start to just help us understand what that is? Sure. You know, when, uh, when we look at uh, how the chemical works, like neurotransmitters, we call them, there's several, several of them. Uh, predominantly dopamine and serotonin. I know it's kind of a boring topic for some people, but typically when the brain is flooded with dopamine and serotonin, um, people go into psychosis. And we're seeing that, uh, I know it's not a topic today, but cannabis use has been really uh, um, having a negative impact where the brain is flooded with dopamine and serotonin. And then when the, when the chemical level drops, it's almost like a water bottle where the water just gets empty or reservoir, it gets empty and empty to the point where uh, people lose hope because the chemical is so low and they need some kind of coping strategy to balance it. And then, you know, of course, sometimes they go to a psychiatrist or the doctor and they get some anti-depressant um, medications. But typically, you know, when we look at the chemical level, we need to bring a balance to it and hopefully, you know, perhaps before the end of the show, we can give some coping strategies, right. healthy coping strategies. Yeah, very good illustration of the water bottle. Mary, what's your response? Yeah, I mean, we do know that with depression, the serotonin and dopamine levels are often lower. Mm -hmm. um, the question is, uh, what comes first? Does my dopamine and serotonin levels drop and that's why I get depressed? Or is it because I'm having depressive thoughts and grief or challenges with my life and as my thoughts go down that road uh, it begins to lower the levels of the serotonin and dopamine and we do know now research shows that if I have a negative thought it does release mm -hmm. a um, toxic chemical um, because it's kind of gearing our body up for responding to survival mm -hmm. so if you kind of look at it from that standpoint uh, it, yes, medication can be really helpful to help adjust, especially if there's the person is really depleted. But you can see that there has to be changes in other areas of their life to really help them get to that, that good level of um, your chemicals in their brain. Yeah, boy, that's helpful. That's really hopeful, Mary, because I mm -hmm. think sometimes when we think about chemical imbalances, we're out of control. It's something that something right. else has to control. But you've just reminded us that there are many things preemptive to that that are in our control mm -hmm. we're going to come right back with more thoughts on depression and what we can do in order to overcome
Well, this has been so helpful having a conversation with you three experts on depression. So I've got another question for you. What are the triggers for depression? Andrew, your thoughts. You know, surprisingly, um, I had an experience where I learned something about myself and um, that was that my body or gluten had changed. Something changed that there was some sort of change in reaction to my body to gluten. And that was a big trigger for me. Mm. Brain fog that lasts for three to four weeks, <laughs> wow. mood irritability, instability. Um, and the worst part about it was that I had no idea what was causing it. Right. I thought I had a mood disorder. It wasn't yeah. until I, 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 I actually fasted and I actually started to feel better. Yeah. So for me, food was a big wow. trigger. Um, I think sometimes we've been talking about stress and I think lifestyle sometimes can be a, a, a big trigger right. where we've just been going and going and going and yeah. we're not aware of uh, the things that really um, cause us to feel discouraged yeah. and depleted and, and unresolved depleted. grief, mm. unresolved trauma, yeah. Yeah. The things that we're not even consciously aware of that have happened yeah. to us before, yeah. they really do inform how we move forward in our lives and our relationships. Yeah. So I think having an awareness of those things yes. and a good sense of, of who we are and how we think, yeah. that's really, really important as well. Oh, it's really good. That word unresolved. Bringing things into the open is the pathway to healing, right? Harrison, your response to that? I agree with Andrew, you know, like unresolved issues can get the mind to start um, becoming very uh, negative, like Mary was saying earlier on. And negativity do really trigger depression when uh, we start thinking less of ourselves, our confidence levels start dropping. Um, even sometimes it may be genetically related, uh, high stress from work, uh, right now with finances. There's so many different, you know, parents... Um, struggling with parenting right now, having the kids at home, that's another big trigger that can also cause depression. Uh, I find like unhealthy eating, as Andrew was saying, also is a big one. But, you know, a lot of these, um, usually, you know, with some of my clients, I explain to them that the brain is like a filing cabinet mm -hmm. and it collects all this information, the good, the bad, and the ugly in life. And as we getting older, for some of us, these negative cards pop up in the surface that are very toxic and as we start pondering it, we may have flashbacks or nightmares from past uh, traumas, for example, or abuse. It also triggers depression and people start feeling very low and mm. feeling very terrible about themselves. And so it's getting the mind to reshift, reconditioning the mind, restructuring our thinking right. is going to help, you know, move us wow. into another level of coping. That is so helpful. Our mind is like a filing cabinet. And that's why we mm. need help from you know with professionals but we also need community and people around where we're you know sharing and going on a journey together to sort through these things okay we we're always focus on hope and we know that the bible and our faith in god brings us hope so what is a biblical view of depression and how should christians respond to it mary your thoughts well, can I first start off by saying that I think that science is biblical mm. in how God has designed our bodies, our minds, mm. and our hearts. So I think if we start with that context, um, we can look at science without fear and know that it's uh, also biblical, good science. That's great, um, so, yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So if you look at the um, results, uh, the World Health Organization does these surveys around depression, and they have found that depression is like the number two um, uh, disability worldwide, uh, just after cardiovascular disease. So, mm -hmm. and the other thing they found was that there's no differences for people who are in a religious community, going to church, following you know, Jesus than in the secular world. Wow. So mental health issues are very much an issue that's um, real. Mm -hmm. And, you know, th there's also research that shows that there are tangible physiological changes that happens in a person's body. Right. So to just uh, simplify it by saying it's sin and we just need to pray our way through it or, or um, you know, uh, go to the church, read your Bible more, it, it simplifies it and it actually creates shame for people who mm. suffer from depression. 
So I think the biblical response is that we are to embrace people who suffer from depression with grace mm -hmm. and love because ultimately what we have found is that the solution, and you're gonna hear us say this again and again, is connection, it's yeah. relationships. Yeah. And um, depression is one of those things that people naturally draw away from those connections. Yes. So if the church, if the Christian community can actually embrace people who are suffering from mental illness and provide them that grace, my goodness, that yeah. is such a huge part of the solution for healing. Oh, thank you for that, Mary. Andrew, what's your thoughts? Certainly, I can remember that period I was talking about before. It actually lasted for about 18 months before I figured out what was happening for me and happening to me and inside of me. And one of the thoughts and beliefs that I had was that I was alone and that I'm not going to be able to come out of this. I'm not going to be able to, you know, support my family. So it, it was it was it was it was terrible. And, you know, so there's there is so much grace that can be found in a loving, supportive community. Yes. And it's also important that we let go of the stigma that we hold on ourselves mm -hmm. and the judgment on ourselves. Because, you know, after the fact, when I came out of it, so many people were like, well, I, I didn't know. Why didn't you tell me? Right? right? Yeah. Sometimes we, we hold on to that shame ourselves with an expectation that I'm supposed to be able to do this. Mm -hmm. I'm alone in this when that is not the truth. Yeah. Right. Not only is God with us, but he has placed people around us and will place people around us that will walk with us, that will literally sit with us. Yeah. I had someone tell me about friends that would come and knock on their door and open their door and bring them food mm -hmm. and sit with them. Mm -hmm. And that was what helped people get wow. through. So I want to encourage people to remember that even though a thought might say, that you are alone and you have to do this on your own. Not every thought that we have is true, right? right? The word encourages us to remember that hope in God, we are not alone. Yes. God, oh, it's, it's, it's Christmas. Yeah. He, came, yeah. he came into the world to be with us and sends his spirit to be with us yeah. so we are not not alone. Yeah. yeah. Well, it was just Christmas. We've just been reminded we're in a new year and we know that God is with us. Okay, really, really quick one practical step that people can take towards wholeness. You've mentioned a few. Mary, go. Uh, reach out for help. Okay, reach out Let for help. Let people know that you're struggling. Yeah. Reach out for prayer, yeah. Good, Harrison. Mm -hmm. Healthy eating. I think that's very important to reshift our eating and uh, start looking at healthy eating. Yeah, oh, good point. And Andrew? I would say continue to pray, but specifically, Pray the scriptures, mm. pray the words that God says, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. think the thoughts about yourself and about your life that he says. That's great. That's great. Thank you so much. This was so helpful. Well, up next, you'll see an incredible story of how God healed Amy from bipolar disorder. Thanks so much, you guys. You've just enriched us so much today. Your CBN family has prepared something especially for you. It's a CBN family Christmas, right in your own home. We've gathered holiday memories, miracle stories, and behind-the-scene glimpses with our hosts, all to bring you the warmth and love of the Christmas season. There will be recipes and crafts, festive music, and family-friendly holiday films and concerts. Download the free CBN family app and join your CBN family this season. Amy Bauman always accepted that her parents loved her. But when she was 11, they divorced, and Amy started believing she was unwanted. They had me so young. I mean, I was the reason they got married. I was a mistake because I had been born. I believed that they were getting a divorce because of me. Those lies started, little seeds were planted in my, my young self. Once faithful church members, her parents stopped going after the divorce. But Amy still prayed and loved God. I was definitely just trying to do what Jesus wanted me to do. I just wanted to follow him. Which is how Amy lived throughout her teens. Then in college, Amy fell in love and asked God if the boy she liked was the one. I heard this no, and I was mad. I remember telling the Lord, 
I, I don't accept that answer. They married and Amy began pulling away from God. I think when I made that first decision to say no to God, other decisions came easier after that. I didn't look so much for God's approval as much as I did when I was younger. I left God at church. Those first years, they were happy. Then they had two children just 14 months apart. As a 26-year-old mother with small children, Amy felt her life start to unravel. I started to, I think, lose control. In early 1996, four years into their marriage, Amy went to see a psychologist who diagnosed her as bipolar. I could swing between periods of highs and lows rather quickly. The highs are great. You have all this energy and the lows are equally extreme. You don't have energy, you don't have any desire to do anything. Medication eventually stabilized her moods, but the stigma of being mentally ill added to the self-doubt and rejection Amy felt as a child. Now I'm mentally ill, I was never gonna get better, I'm unfit, I'm unqualified, I'm not a good wife. My husband had to live with all of that, and that put a really big stress on our marriage. Out of control spending and debt forced them into bankruptcy. Her husband coped by drinking and staying out late most nights. Amy felt helpless and cried out to God. And I remember standing in the kitchen, answering calls from creditors, balancing a checkbook that had no money into it. And I finally knew that I needed to do something different. And I said, Lord, I can't do this anymore. I have made such a mess of my life. You need to change something. You need to break in because I can't do this anymore. I didn't know what to do except take one step at a time with him holding my hand. And, and it really felt good. But her marriage was too fractured. And in 2007, Amy and her husband divorced. Being a single mom with mental issues was challenging. And those feelings of being unloved increased. I didn't have such extreme highs and lows. But I still questioned myself on everything. Amy found a good church and grew closer to God. Two years later, she married a widower, thinking this new marriage would fill her need to feel loved. But Amy soon felt she was competing with her husband's memories of his late wife. I came in with rejection and um, issues from my first marriage from the divorce, feeling like I was damaged goods. I was a mistake that I shouldn't have never been born. My, my parents got married because of me. They got divorced because of me, that I was unqualified and unfit and mentally ill. And now I was never gonna be her. He was never gonna love me enough. Seeing her desperation, a friend invited Amy to a prayer meeting. As the women started praying, Amy began repenting for things in her life. Every lie that I had believed about myself, we claimed the truth over that and then got to my marriage and I even forgave his first wife and I broke down not even knowing that there was this bitterness that I was carrying against a woman that I had never even met before it was just him renewing me renewing my spirit renewing who I was letting me know how much he loved me when I walked out of there I felt like this new person she felt God also healed her from her bipolar disorder. Amy weaned herself off her medication and notified her doctor. He could see from visit after visit that I was doing exceptionally well. And he said, well, as long as you keep this path that you're doing well, we won't have you take any medication. And I just came on my six year anniversary of being healed. Amy's transformation improved her marriage and she and her husband are closer to each other and to God. Today, Amy loves to share the abundant life that's available when you learn to see yourself the way God sees you. The word says that God has come to give us life and give it to us to the fullest. I want people to grab onto that. I want them to know that there's hope, that they don't have to be stuck in that mental illness, stuck in that um, place of brokenness, stuck in that regret stuck in that depression, that God gives us life, God gives us purpose, and that's what he wants for us. I know who I belong to. I am the daughter of the Most High King.
Well, we certainly learned today that God is able to heal us from mental illness, just like in Amy's story, but it can be a journey. I've so appreciated our discussion so far this week from our panel, and a few things that really stood out to me was, you know, that water bottle illustration that Harrison shared, but we, we can run depleted and we need to be refilled. And I believe that a lot of that happens in light of community, leaning into other people around you, the people that can even, whether they're even friends and family, but also going for the professional help when you maybe don't have anyone else to talk to. But I can assure you that for 24 seven, we're here for you. 1-855-759-0700, our prayer partners are people that you can trust. They're people that have been even trained to speak with wisdom and to pray with you and to talk with you. So don't hesitate to call us. We also have a wonderful, hope-filled package of resources. They're free for the asking. So why don't you call us and all of these resources can be yours, uh, including the Book of Hope. Uh, we were talking about depression today and there's a unique resource even in light of that. I wanna pray uh, for some of our viewers, they've sent in prayer requests. Beverly said, pray for my son whose mental health is not good right now. And Julie said, please pray that God takes away all the stress I'm feeling inside. Well, Lord, I just come to you and I bring Beverly's son to you and I just pray for his mental health and I pray that he would turn to you. You are our hope and peace and you will bring him healing and I just pray that in Jesus' name he would turn to you and I pray for the stress that Julie's experiencing inside and I know for many viewers who are watching that we'd be able to take this internal stress and we'd be able to cast it on you, Lord Jesus, and that you would take us on this journey of healing with the help of others. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. John 16, 33 is a very important scripture that we all need to be reminded of. I have told you these things, Jesus said, so that in me, you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Well, that is the truth from our Lord Jesus himself. Thanks for watching. Give us a call. To contact us, visit 700club.ca. Tomorrow on the 700 Club Canada. The focus was all about they need to do well in school so that they can get a really good job and that they can be stable. And that was the entire focus. So as Andrew says, if that's all you have, that's your strength. When you enter a situation where that may be depleted or even taken away, who do you rest on?